Hello and welcome to the Blue Open Studio tutorial video series. The topic of this video will be trending. And in this video, we will be discussing how the trending feature works, properties of the trend worksheet, properties of the trend control object, and we will demonstrate creating a trend worksheet, configuring a trend control object, operating a trend control object, locating the history files in Windows Explorer, and viewing the history files outside of Blue Open Studio. The trending feature inside of Blue Open Studio is split up into two separate components. The trend worksheet, which is the sampling itself, and the trend control object, which is the trend graph. These two functions can be used independently from one another. And that is because at the core of this feature are the tags. And whenever a tag changes value, it will drive plotting the data on the screen in a graph or saving the data to a historical file via the worksheet. If just the trend control object or the graph itself is used without an historical file behind it, the data for those pens is stored into memory. So if you were to navigate away from the screen and return to it or stop and then start the runtime again, the data that was plotted on the graph is now lost. And then when you return to that screen, it will just begin plotting again without any data existing on the screen. In addition, the trend control object can be configured during runtime for different views and different pens. And those views can be saved so they can be loaded again at runtime. So for example, if say the operator on shift one has a certain way he likes to view the graph, but the operator for shift two likes a completely different way to see it, they can have their own views and just simply save them. And then when their shift comes up, select to load them in. The trending feature inside of Blue Open Studio is by far the most complex to configure. That is because of the numerous settings that are available for not only the trend worksheet, but also the trend control object. So this video will be laid out a little differently. We will first go through setting up a basic trend control object to display time-based data from a few tags. And then there will be an addendum to this video that will cover all of the additional settings for the trend control object. So the first thing we'll need to do is create a trend worksheet. So inside of the Blue Open Studio development, we go to the Tasks tab in the Project Explorer. And the second item down is Trend. If we right click and select Insert, we get the Trend Worksheet. And we have a header at the top, and below that is the body. On the header, we have a description field, which we will enter in Training Trend. And this is just a descriptor for this specific worksheet. And then below that, we have a drop down list for the history format. And you have two options available. You either have proprietary, which stores the data in a binary file with the extension .hst, or database, which allows you to configure a connection to an external database, for example, SQL or Oracle, and save the data to a table in that database. So if we were to drop this down and select database, we now see that we have the database configuration button available to us to the right of the dropdown. And in the body, we get an additional column called field. This field column corresponds to the field or column names in the table where this trending data will be stored. Uh, for us though, we're gonna leave it at proprietary. And then under the advanced button, this gives us options for configuring batch information, which we will cover in the addendum with all of the other additional features. For us, we're going to leave everything blank. And then below that, we have our options for the saving frequency. By default, the box for save on trigger is checked. And in the trigger field, we have the tag second entered in. And this is the default setting. So what this does is whenever the tag in this field changes value or toggles, it will save the values for any tags listed in the worksheet body. And we can change this from a second to something else. There are two system tags that run faster than that. There is a blink slow, which toggles every 600 milliseconds, 
and then there is a blink fast, which toggles every 200 milliseconds. For us, though, to, to start, we'll leave it on the second tag. And then to the right of that is a box for save on tag change. With this box checked, it will save the values of the tags listed in the worksheet body whenever they change values. So you can use both together or you can use one or the other independently. And what this will do is this will give you some comprehensive coverage for any values that may change. So say you want to record information for the majority of your tags on a specific frequency, let's say once a second. But let's say you have two or three tags that run much faster than that that you want to get additional samples from. Well, you can simply click on Save on Tag Change, and then it will pull once a second to get all of the data from the tags. But then if any of those tags change values before that cycle, it will also record them as well. For us, though, we're going to leave Save on Tag Change unchecked. Then in the worksheet body, we are going to add in our four tags that we are going to trend. And in the tag name field, we can either type them in. So for example, the first one will be temperature. Or we can right click and select insert tag. And in this case, I'm going to go to my integers. And I'm going to find SEC counter one. And I'm going to copy that and paste it twice and then change the second one to SEC counter two and the last one to SEC counter three. And the second column in the main body is the dead band column. And this works similar to the dead band that we saw for the deviation alarms in a previous video. And it only comes into effect when the save on tag change box is checked. So for example, if we put a value of five in here for our temperature, whenever the tag temperature changes value, if it is within a plus or minus range of five, that change will be ignored. If it is outside of that, then it recognizes that as a valid change, and then it records it into the appropriate destination, be it the proprietary file or a database. So if we have a temperature value of 50 with a dead band of five, if it changes to 52, that change is ignored. But if it changes from 50 to 56, it sees that it is outside of the dead band, and then it records it into our proprietary history file. For us, we're gonna leave all of our dead bands at blank, which means no dead band takes effect, so any change will be recorded. So now that we have our trend worksheet configured, I will save. And I will leave the sheet number set to one. And now under the tasks tab, if I expand trend, I see that my trend worksheet one shows up. So now that we have our trend worksheet configured, we can create a trend control object on the screen. So I will go to the graphics tab in the project explorer. I'll expand screens and open up my template screen. I will save this as a new screen with the name Trend. So now on the Graphics tab of the ribbon menu, under Data Objects, I will select Trend, and then I will click and drag to draw it on the screen. And we see that the Trend Control object has three different components. We have the toolbar up at the top, then we have the actual graph plotting area with a date and time selection uh, in the middle. And then at the bottom is the legend for whatever pens we have configured. So I will double click to open the properties. And inside of the object properties window, we have several different buttons that we can get into with the configuration dialogs. Uh, before we get into those, down at the bottom, we have the option for the border. And this is the border strictly for the trending area itself. So I can change the border from sunken to solid and change the color if I want to say a green and you see that it shows up there. I'm going to change it back to sunken. And then the background is the background color for the graphing or trending area. By default it's set to white. We could have it be transparent or no fill or we can change it to a different color for example black. I am going to change it back to white though. And now up above, we have six configuration dialog options. There's points, 
which configures the pens that will be displayed on the trend control. Data sources, which allows you to configure a data source for X, Y, or scatter graphs. So if you want to display data that is not time-based, you would come in and configure a data source to pull the information in from a destination, be it a database or an external file like a text or CSV file. Then we have the option for the axes, that's the X and Y axes for the actual graph itself. Then the legend, which is the information down here at the bottom, we can configure what's displayed there by default and what's available at runtime. The toolbar at the top, once again, what options are available and any shortcuts that we may want to use. And then the advanced, which is any additional functionality for the trend control. So in the initial part of this video, we will simply go through creating our points or our pens and configuring a refresh rate under advanced. So we will first go into points and we see that we have in this dialog, it looks like a grid layout. So we have several columns. We have the point number, we have a label, color, data source, tag field, the min and max scale, your style, options, SPC, and hide. So for our first one, we are going to configure this one as our temperature. So for a label, I'm just simply going to put in temperature. And for the color, I will change this to red. And the data source, because we have our axis set as time-based, we only have one data source, and that is tag. Because it's time-based, we cannot pull in from a external source. Now, this does not mean that we can't pull in historical data from either a database or a HST file. That is determined on if a tag that is being plotted on a graph also exists in a worksheet. It makes that link in the background through the software. So it sees that my temperature tag is being plotted on this trend control, and it goes to see if it's also included in any of our trend worksheets. If it is, it can then go into that file and pull out the historical data to plot it back. Even though it's not linked through the control object, it is linked in the background of the software during runtime. And then I enter in my tag or field name. In this case, I can either type it in or I can right click and select insert tag. And in this case, in selection, I'm going to start typing in temp and select temperature. And then our min and our max scale. This is the individual upper and lower limits that we want to use for this specific pen. Uh, I'm going to set this min scale to 0 and the max to 100. And then our style. This allows us to configure the line settings for the specific pen. Uh, you have options for state, be it normal or out of limits, which means if it is outside of our maximum range. And this is not an either or. You are configuring the normal and then the out of limits. And you see that there's a checkbox here that says use normal settings. So if I uncheck this, I can select a different color and a different pattern and line type if it's outside of the normal limits. So if I come in and I leave everything the same, but I change color to yellow and I click OK, you see that that changes as well. That's because this is a shortcut for the color style. So they give you the basic settings if you want to quickly get a trend graph configured. So I'll change this back to red. And then we have our options. Inside of our options are several different fields where we can enter in tags to store this information. However, the one I should mention here is the break interval. And this has to do with the distance or amount of time between points or re between recordings. So let's say we're reading in data from a PLC and all of a sudden communication is lost to the PLC. The break interval by default is set to 7200, and that is in seconds. So that equates out to two hours. So if we're reading data in from a PLC and all of a sudden communication stops, we're no longer plotting on the screen. The trend graph continues to scroll along because time is still incrementing. If we say go an hour and 50 minutes later and we reestablish communication and a new point comes in, when that new point comes in, the graph will draw a line between those two points to connect them because it is within the break interval of 7,200 seconds. Let's say that communication isn't reestablished until two and a half hours later. 
Well, then that is outside of the break interval. So when that new data point comes in, a line will not be drawn between the two. You will just have a gap. That is what the break interval is for. It isn't necessarily important for most, but if you're dealing with historical data that goes back a long way and you're dealing with consistency of, of information or data coming in, it may come into play depending on what you want to do. So we're going to leave everything set to default here. And then SPC stands for Statistical Process Control. This is essentially metrics information on the data being plotted for that pen. We have the options for average, min, max values, the standard deviation, and the count, meaning the number of points for that pen. And we would put tags in here to retain that information, to display it on a screen or use it in a script or wherever the case may be. Then we have the option for hide. With a tag configured in the hide column, if the value is true, the data point is hidden from the trend display. It's not removed, it is just hidden so it will not be displayed on the graph. And we can do this for individual pens. So now I will add in my additional fields. So the second one will be counter number one. And I will just add the labels in for all three right now. Third will be counter number two. And the last will be counter number three. The colors, I'll just pick a couple of contrasting ones. So sky blue, green, and then orange. Data source for all those, I'll leave a tag. And for the tag field, the first one will be SEC counter one. Second is SEC counter two. And the last is SEC counter three. For the min and max scale, I'll set all of these to zero to 100. And a simple way to do this, I can copy individual cells and I can paste them in. And then I will leave everything else set to default. I'll even come in here and I'll make sure that these match. Now we have the basic settings configured for the points for a trend control object. I'll click OK to get back to the object properties. And as you can see, my control object in the background has updated with my new setting. And now the only other thing we need to configure is the refresh rate or frequency for the graph itself. As I mentioned earlier, the trend control object and the trending worksheet can work independently from one another. We saw how the frequency for writing or saving the data through the worksheet is configured. The trend control object has its own refresh cycle. And to find that, we go under the advanced dialog and it is the update trigger. And by default, it's set to second, meaning once a second, it will refresh the graph and plot new data points and then connect them with old data points. So we will leave that set to second. And now we have our trend control configured for a basic display of data. In a previous video, we configured the three SEC counters to increment automatically using the scheduler. However, for the temperature, we need to manually modify that. So I will first resize my trend control object to give me a little space off on the left hand side. I will open up my alarm screen and I will copy off my temperature slider and paste it here. And now I can expand this out a little bit more just to give us some more room. Now we have our screen configured the way that we want it. However, I need to go back into navigation and create a new button to navigate to the screen from the startup. So I'll copy off the alarms button, change the open function to open the trend screen, and then change the caption to read trend. And now I will save and I will close all of my screens and my worksheet. And then I will start the runtime. And now with the runtime started, I will go to my trend screen. And we see that we already have data plotting. And we see down below in the legend, we have our four tags and we see what the current values are and what the cursor values are. We see though that the temperature tag 
has a flat value of zero because we haven't changed it. So if I increment this up to say 78, we now see that change reflected. And as you can see, we have data scrolling along just fine. And by default, the trend control object can segment or separate each pen into its own area or section. Uh, up in the toolbar, there is an option for multiple sections. By default, that's enabled. If we disable that, then it looks like a standard trend graph where all four points are trending along in the same range. We still have our min and max ranges for each pen over here, but they're all plotted in the same area. Additionally, there is another button called auto scale. And what this does is this automatically adjusts the min and max range for each pen to just fit the minimum and maximum plotted value on the trend control. So when I click on it, you see that they all adjust. So the counter number two has a min value of 43 and a max of 72. And the temperature has a min of 28 and a max of 128. And the other two remained at zero to 100. If I click it again, you see that those values change because it is a dynamic range that is setting whenever you click that button. When you start up, the cursor will be on the far left and it'll be this blue line sitting here. We can move it along on the trend graph and we will see what the value is whenever the pen intersects the cursor. And the cursor will remain stationary as the data moves along. So we can see this value increment for the cursor and that's independent than from the current value that we see. And then down at the bottom, because we are using historical data or time-based, we have the option for selecting a specific date or specific time or what the duration is. And the duration is how much time do we show on the graph? By default, it's set to one minute. We could say set this to 10 minutes. And now you see that it expands it out. Even though this hasn't been running for 10 minutes, it is showing as much as it can. We can also go back and see values from a previous day and expand this out to the current day. So we could go all the way back, let's say to December 1st, and we only wanna show from the 1st to the 3rd, we could. And then we could expand this out to our current date on both as well. And then I will set this back to one minute. In some additional information about the layout of the trend control object during runtime, up at the top in the toolbar, we have these run and stop or pause buttons. So right now I can pause it and I can view information here without it scrolling along. As soon as I click run again, it will jump to the current time and draw all of that data that has been queued since I paused the graph. Then we have the option for selecting a period, which means we can also type in a duration or we can select the type. And we'll go over these types when we go over the additional settings for the trend control in the video addendum. Then we have an option for zooming. If we wanna do a horizontal or a vertical zoom, if we wanna zoom in or zoom out, and then we can cancel our zoom and reset it to default. And then the legend properties. So down here we can select what options we have. Once again, we'll go over these in the video addendum. So we have all of these available and these are the current ones that are visible. And then we have the option for changing the pen style for whichever pen we have selected. So right now I have pen one selected. I can either set it up here or down in the legend, I can do it as well. Then we have the options for adding a pen. I can't because all four that are configured are being displayed or removing a pen. And I can do this either up here. If I had a pen, I can also do it down here as well. We already discussed the multiple sections and then we can turn the cursor on and off. The auto scale, if we want it to print out to a external file or to a printer, we could do that. And then the SPC, and I will add in one more just so we can get a better look. 
So SPC, once again, stands for Statistical Process Control. With this, we can select what statistics to show. And when we do that, we see we either get lines or we can do shading as well. And the different options are the average, the min and max, and the standard deviation. And we can either do a dotted line or we can do shading. Now this is not storing it into any tags because we never configured that. But what it is doing is displaying it on the screen in real time. So this isn't being stored anywhere where it will be permanent. It is simply being stored in memory and is being calculated as data is being generated and plotted onto the graph. So I'm going to turn all of these off. And then our legend down at the bottom, I already talked about the delete or remove. We can also hide or show a pen, and this doesn't remove it. It just simply makes it hidden from the current view on the graph. Then our option for changing the pen style. And then at the very front is what looks like a folder icon. And what this does, this allows us to select a different point. So I only have two currently loaded here. So I can change this. Instead of temperature, I want to look at counter two. And now it simply swaps it out. And if I click on auto scaling, it'll come back in. So I can change these to whatever pens I want. However, if I had all four pens that I have configured visible, this will not give me an option because there aren't any that are available that aren't being plotted. So this is the basic configuration or a quick start for using the trend control object and the trending worksheet. As I mentioned previously in the addendum, we'll go through all of the different settings for not only the trend worksheet, but the trend control object as well. Now we have our trend control object configured plotting data. We also are storing information into an historical file. If we wanted to locate that history file, we could do that through Windows Explorer. So if I open Windows Explorer and I browse to my application directory, which is on my C drive and it's the BOS underscore training folder, we have a folder here called HST. If I open that, here is the historical file for the trend worksheet. And the format of the file name is similar to how the alarm files are formatted. However, the files for trending are broken up into not only each day, but also each worksheet because they segment or separate each worksheet into its own historical file. So the file name has two digits for the worksheet number, and then two digits for the year, two digits for the month, and two digits for the day. Now, if I try to open this in Notepad, when it opens up, all I see is garbage. The only values that make any sense are at the very top, where it gives me my four tags that I have configured. That is because this is a binary file. So we cannot open it in a normal text editor. So if we wanted to view this file in a standard format outside of Blue Open Studio, we'd have to run a conversion on the file. So in order to convert the HST file to a readable format, we have to execute a built-in function. So I will go back into Blue Open Studio and open the TechRef. And I will search for HST to TXT. And this is a built-in function that will export the historical data from the trend history file into a plain text file. And this function has several arguments required. The first is the start date, and the second is the start time. And this is because it doesn't do just one file. It does a range. So you give it a start date and time, and then you give it a duration, which is the third argument. And that is the duration in hours for the data to be exported. And it starts from the specified date and time. And for example, if you want to do less than an hour, you would put a decimal in. So if I want to do half an hour, I would put in 0 0.5. Then you have the group number that you want to give it. And this corresponds to the worksheet number. When we save the file, we gave ours worksheet number of one. 
and then you give it the target file name. By default, it stores it into the application directory. If you wanted to save it in another directory, you would give it the full path and the file name as well. And then we have a couple of optional arguments. The first is a separator. By default, it uses the tab character, but we could give it a comma or a slash or an equal sign or whatever other delimiter we would want to use. And then there are two flags, one for if we want to display milliseconds for the timestamp. By default, it does not show it. Then there is the format for the date. By default, it's day, month, and year. But we also have the options for month, day, year, and year, month, and day. And then there is our last argument, which is the interval. And what this does is if we give it a numerical value of, let's say, 10, it will take every 10th entry in the historical file and export it. So if we don't want all of them, we just want a few, we could put an interval in here and it would only take X number. So every 10th one or every third or whatever the case may be would pull those out. If it's left blank, which is the default, it will take every single entry and export it out of the HST file. So there are two options we have for executing this. The first is with a built-in function like this through a button, or we could also run the command line utility hst to txt.exe. And this does the same thing, but it does a single file. So if you look at the section here for converting trend history files from binary to text, it gives us all the information we need in order to run this executable through the command line. We will configure how to execute this through the application. So I will go back in to Blue Open Studio and I'll open my trend screen and I will go up to the graphics tab on the ribbon and I will place a button. I will open it and change the caption to export and under command, I'll go to the on up tab and change it from built in language to VB script. Type in dollar sign to bring up the IntelliSense and start typing HST. I'll select the appropriate function, which is HST to TXT. And then with a open parenthesis, I see a tooltip come up and it gives me all of the arguments that are required or available for the function. And the one in bold is the current one that I'm on. So I'll start with today's date and that will be in quotes. And then a time. And this is in 24 hour format. So for example, right now I would have to put in 20 in order to get 8 PM and then the duration. And this is in hours. So I want to do the last 10 minutes, which is one sixth. So we will narrow it down to a fifth. So I'll put in 0 0.2. And then the group number, which is one, and then the target file. And this has to be in quotes as well. And I'm just simply going to put trend underscore export.txt and you have to include the extension and for the rest of the optional parameters I will leave them blank to use the default and then I will right click and select check script it comes back and says that the script is okay meaning my syntax is correct and now we have our export utility properly configured so I will save and then I will snap my development to the left hand side of the screen and snap my runtime to the right. And now I will click on export. And now if I open up Windows Explorer and I go to my application folder, you see that I do not have a file. And that is because under notes in the tech graph for the HST to TXT function, the fourth paragraph shows, although this function can be called while the project is either running or stopped, it can be executed only if the project has ran at least once. 
If you try to call this function before the project has ran, for example, you start the application and then immediately enter this function in the database by, it will fail without error. What that says is you first have to start and then stop the runtime just once in order for this function to execute properly. So what I will do is I will come back in and I will stop my runtime. Then I will close my trend screen. I will start my runtime again. And then I will snap my runtime back to the right. Go to my trend screen. And then I will click export. And now if I navigate to my application folder, I see that I have my trend export.txt. In addition, it also created a .hdr file. And this is essentially the header file. So if we open the txt file, we see that we have several columns. We have a date column, a time column, and then one column for each point of data being recorded through the worksheet. And if we open the .htr file in Notepad, we see that it gives us the number of tags being recorded through this worksheet. So it says it gives us the number four and then each tag name that is being used. So we have now seen how to properly configure a trend worksheet and a trend control object. We've seen how to locate the historical files through Windows Explorer and how to view them outside of Blue Open Studio. However, there is one more caveat to the trend feature. And that is if you wanted to add tags to an existing worksheet. So if I go back into development, and I'll maximize this to view it better. I'll go to tasks and I'll bring up my training trend worksheet. I want to add a new tag here. So I'm going to add the existing tag flow rate. So now with flow rate put in there, if I go to save the worksheet, I get a message and it says, warning, tag changes in any trend group will only take place in the next day history file. What this means is that the software will be unable to go in and either add this new tag to an existing or any previous historical data files, or if we removed a tag, remove that tag's value from any existing or previous historical data files. So this change will only take effect the next time a historical file is generated. So if we click OK, we now have a new tag configured. However, it will not take effect until the next day. There is one way to go around that. And that would be to come in to your HST folder and delete the current day's history file. If you do that, the application will generate a brand new one and it will be able to include that existing tag. The only downside is any data from that historical file will be deleted when the file is deleted. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact ProFace America Technical Support by phone at 1 800 289 9266 option 2 or by email support at profaceamerica.com you can also visit our website profaceamerica.com for manuals drivers product faqs and other product and software information thanks again and have a great day